and thanks everybody for joining um, tonight. Um, I know we're getting more and more used to Zoom and, and actually it's a fantastic platform to be able to uh, do these teaching and training sessions. So we're gonna talk tonight about the Cadence flat top, um, but in order to do so, we wanna also get some background and have you make sure you have an understanding of the Cadence system. The Cadence system actually came about with four design surgeons, two of which uh, myself and uh, Dr. Pettits are here with you tonight but also, also Tim Daniels and Chris Heyer. And um, the thought process was to put together four guys who, who were very efficient in the operating room and, and could streamline uh, the, the offering of the system. And so we were looking to streamline the instrumentation so that you could have better efficiencies in the operating room and have advanced anatomic fit for your patients as an option so that you can get better coverage and better outcomes for your patients. And so that was really what we aimed to do to get an efficient, predictable ankle replacement system. And when we sat down to do this, the design rationale really focused on the tibia, then the talus, and then the poly. And on the tibial side, we wanted to have a sulcus and the tibial base plate to uh, basically, basically recreate your incisura. And so you actually had a left and a right total ankle system. We wanted to be able to give you greater depth per size so that you could cover the posterior aspect of the tibia better. And then also the way the system is built, you get three cortices of coverage, the anterior, the lateral, and the posterior cortices are covered by the tibial tray. Um, and, and so that was really what we were looking to, to accomplish. On the tailor side, we wanted to have a conical talus, and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on. And we wanted to be able to kind of have very little of the bone taken away on the tailor side to preserve blood supply, to preserve bone stock, and essentially, essentially resurface the talus. For the poly, we wanted to have an option for a highly cross-linked ultra high molecular weight poly that had comprehensive sizes in one millimeter increments. And then we were the first to have a system that allowed for biased polys. And you'll see why that's important as well to get that coronal, um, sorry, the sagittal alignment. So when you look at the talus, there's five different sizes. It is made of cobalt chromium, but there's a conical axis of about eight degrees. And the nice thing about the talus is we've created it such that the pegs that you use are in the same location, whether you use a size one or a size five talus, which means if you think you're putting a size one, you prepare entirely for a size one, and then you trial it and you say, hey, I need to upsize, you can without worrying about creating new holes in the talus. Now the anatomic tailor implant was important to us because we wanted to make sure we could give you a conical axis of rotation, which really would mirror more of the natural kinematics of the ankle um, for each individual patient. And so when you look at a patient and you see them plantar flex and dorsiflex, you notice that they actually go into inversion as a plantar flex. And so the conical articular surface was really built to be able to provide them some of that inversion uh, that, that you normally would get uh, with, with a native ankle. Um, so we have rail curvatures along two planes. And so uh, that allows for this to basically be able to recreate that internal rotation. Now on the tibial side, again, you have a left and a right because you do have an incisura. We were trying to get three cortices of coverage and you can see that in that CT image on the right there. And really trying to, again, recreate anatomy with minimal bone resection uh, and maximal coverage for right and left ankles. On the tibial side, we also have five sizes with the pegs being in the exact same location, regardless of the size. So again, allows you to be able to change sizes if you need to on the fly without worrying about uh, the, recreating new holes into to the distal tibia. On the poly side, um, really, I think one of the, the major things that we had designed was an anterior and posterior bias, which allows you to have a two millimeter additional buildup of material, either in the anterior or posterior aspect of a, of a poly, so that you could push the talus posteriorly or anteriorly as needed. Obviously, there's a neutral poly as well. And when you look at the impact of the poly that are biased on range of motion, both in plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, see the chart below, it really doesn't affect uh, the range much. About eight degrees is the only change you see. So these patients are able to still get their active range of motion that they want. And this becomes important 
with the biased polys. Now, if you draw a line down the center of your tibia on a sagittal view and you create the center of talus uh, a circle, you oftentimes, in, in some papers quote up to 30 to 40% of the times, will see that the center of the talus is not aligned in the center of the tibia. And this can be difficult to try to get back onto the center of tibia. And if you don't get it under the center of the tibia, there is some discussion of whether or not you increase the failure rate of these total ankles. And so in this case, you can try to get that, uh, we, we were able to get that back onto the tibia with a osteotomy of the calcaneus and be able to get this lined up. But sometimes you can't do it. You can debride all the osteophytes away. You can do everything you want, um, to lengthen the Achilles, whether it's a, a TAL or a gastro procession, and you still can't get it lined up. So what do you do? You can add a, a, a poly uh, that's biased to be able to reduce the, the talus either anteriorly or posteriorly. And again, when we first designed this, there was concern of whether or not we would change the arc of motion. And when we looked at this, it does not really statistically change the arc of motion, which is important for patients on outcomes. So when you look at the tibial components, the Taylor components and the poly, and you look at all the different combinations you can get, um, and then you add on top of it the flat talus, you see that we can actually put together over a thousand combinations for a patient, which means you can get an optimal fit, a quote unquote, customized off the shelf solution where it's not a true customized implant. And that's important to be able to provide patients the, the type of anatomy and solution that they need to get the outcome that they want. And when we talk about the cadence, I also want you to think about OR efficiencies and streamlining your cases because we really spent a lot of time looking at the instrumentation, making sure that you could reproducibly put the implants where you want them based on the instrumentation both on the tibial side and the tailor side. We really also tried to minimize the number of times drill holes were going into the talus because we felt that you did not want to make the talus into a pin cushion and run the risk of creating avascular necrotic lesions throughout parts of the talus or the talus entirely. And so the, the implants, uh, sorry, the instrument instrumentation is really built around efficiently and effectively getting uh, the, the heights of the resections done, the rotations done, uh, and the chamfer cuts done in a way that you can make it very repeatable and very easy to do. In addition, the trays are only two trays. We really, again, wanted to make this efficient, not only for the surgeon, but also for the scrubs and the OR staff so that they're not lugging around three or four totes. Uh, there's some data to suggest out of the total joint literature that the more instrument cases you have, the higher your risk of infection. So if we could streamline this down to two, two cases, uh, it makes it a lot easier for the scrub techs and the OR uh, uh, staff to deal with the, the, the instrumentation required to implant the ankle replacement. And lastly, the layout of the instruments is very intuitive. You start on one part of the box and you work your way through the first box, and then you do the same thing for the second box, which means if you don't have the same people scrubbing in with you day in and day out, you can actually have somebody who's in there in the operating room with you and the rep can easily walk them through the natural flow of the instrumentation. Um, again, the instrumentation is done, designed to provide uh, key markers on fluoroscopy so that you know the height of the tibia that you need to take out. You can figure out how much of the talus to take out and you can also look at how to make the anterior and posterior chamfer cuts. Um, the talus, we wanted to make it so that you could use drill holes multiple times, use pins multiple times for different steps to allow you to prepare for a chamfered uh, anterior and posterior chamfered talus. Uh, and then again, the intuitive tray and inst instrument layout within the sets itself. The thought again is if we can make it so that you could rely on the instrumentation, you don't need to do a lot of free handing. You don't need to do a lot of second guessing and you can re reproducibly put the implant where you want. You can actually trust the instrumentation, which allows you to be more efficient, which means that the patients can get off the table faster and faster OR times, we think will translate into better outcomes for patients because you don't have to worry about uh, increased anesthesia times and some of the medical issues that can occur with that. Um, when you compare OR times of the cadence to the right medical infinity and the inbone with 
prophecy PSI, it has been shown to be faster than those implant systems. So again, a, a system that is effective, efficient, um, and gets you where you want to be for this patient. So you can do implant constructs that are flat. You can do the chamfer. Um, remember, we do have two, uh, two pegs on the talus, two on the tibia. Um, and then on the tibia side, there's this little uh, um, sled that you'll see in the posterior aspect of the tibia. Uh, it is mirrored by a sled on the flat dome talus, which, uh, which um, Dave will talk about in a few moments. So in terms of key surgical technique steps that you need to keep in mind, it's just like any other total ankle systems like you have done, but you can trust this instrumentation. You do the tibia alignment through an external guide. You do a flat cut resection on the tibia. You'll do a flat uh, resection on the talus. Um, you'll verify the implant gap. You'll size the talus, do your final trialing, and then prep for implantation. So um, Dave's going to talk about when to use a flat cut talus so that you have an idea of when you may want to do a chamfer versus when you want to do a flat top. Thanks. Thanks, Dylan. Okay. And thank you everyone for joining us. So when to use a flat cut talus? Um, so total ankle replacement, as many of us who perform them are aware, is a challenging procedure. And revision total ankle replacement, which often can involve a flat cut like this uh, case on the right, um, is even more challenging, right? There is bone loss that we're sometimes dealing with. There's some deformity, poor soft tissues, and um, revision is not always an option <clears throat> for patients who have uh, a failed ankle replacement. So I want to talk about the core issues of the talus. So when you're thinking about an ankle replacement and what kind of replacement I need on the talus, the core issues are <clears throat> taking less bone, right? Because that's really what we want to do. Preserving blood supply. Dealing with AVN. What do you do with the second stage after a periprosthetic joint infection? You have to also consider prior Taylor implants if you're uh, doing a revision. There are also some anatomic Taylor variants with a short Taylor neck or a collapsed dome. And these are the things I kind of want to go through. So my history with implants is I trained with Roger Mann and I used the mobile bearing um, star implant exclusively for five years. Um, but the issue that I kind of had was like, here's an example of someone with, um, you know, fairly end stage tibial Taylor arthritis. And here's what it looks like with the, with the star implant on there. Um, and it's a truncated pyramid, right? So it's a flat cut with an anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral chamfer, right? So that's a lot of cutting, okay? Definitely impinges on the blood supply. And additionally, you can't see underneath it, right? So the Taylor component on the left is like a dome right? You can, it's like a, it's like a helmet. Whereas the Taylor components on the right, the chamfered and then the flat cut canids, you can see underneath them, you can see what's going on. So a situation like this, and I'm not suggesting the implant itself was the reason that it failed, but I am telling you that you can see how there's no bony ingrowth on three quarters of that Taylor implant. And I wouldn't have known that looking at the x-rays until the implant subsided. So I felt that was a significant problem. And for that reason, I wanted a Taylor component where I could see underneath it. And additionally, where I didn't really damage the blood supply so much so that perhaps I'd get better bony end growth. So the implants that have helped me are these implants right here, where we're looking at the, the flat cut talus, the Salto XT and the XT revision, right? All of which have flat cuts and these implants essentially solve my clinical needs. Um, here's an example of the uh, flat cut Salto as well as the flat cut. Uh, cadence. And that sort of is dealing with taking less bone. The Taylor component on the chamfer cut and the flat cut for the cadence take off significantly less bone than the implant that I was typically used, uh, used to. Um, so how do we deal with AVN and prior Taylor implants? Well, here's an example of, of cases with AVN. They obviously often need advanced imaging. Um, and that's really important, at least even in the middle, in the middle case, you can see how there's um, avascular necrosis of the navicular as well, um, and cyst formation within the Taylor body. These are all important things to consider before you would even um, 
go ahead with uh, ankle replacement. Here's an example of someone who is one year post-op from a, uh, a cadence total ankle replacement. And you can see back here, there's really a lack of bony ingrowth. And is that lack of bony ingrowth from a post-traumatic avascular area that I wasn't able to figure out prior to surgery? Either way, this is, a kind of, this is the kind of scenario in which you're gonna need to revise this. So what can you do? Well, what we did for her is we revised her to a flat cut and we bone grafted, right? I bone grafted underneath the entire implant. I took calcaneal autograft, which you can see on the bottom right. And then I put synthetic bone graft uh, on the end of the implant itself. Um, and the flat cut really gives us a nice surface to kind of salvage what we were left with in the center photograph. So that's how I've dealt with ABN. Um, how about the second stage post-joint infection. Um, here's an example of a patient who has, uh, who's in the midst of a second stage with a spacer. You can see how their Taylor dome is kind of small. It's um, collapsed a little bit. There's not a lot of room to be making chamfer cuts in this patient. Um, and so for this example, this patient has um, a biased uh, flat cut Taylor implant from the XT revision system, um, which functioned quite nicely for them, but gave, really gave us a nice pedestal to uh, put the implant on. When we talk about an anatomic talus variance, like obviously this is a situation in which the patient is not even considered for an ankle replacement, but there are situations in which they have a short neck or a collapsed dome where you need to consider it. So here's an example where there's a short tail, tailor neck and a post-traumatic deformity. And here's another example where there's a collapsed Taylor dome, where really the transition from the neck of the talus to the dome of the talus is really minimal, right? It's almost like straight across. Um, and if you are going to make chamfered cuts, you are going to dig significantly into the neck of the talus, which is not something that we would really like to do. Um, so this is, the, you know, the, the flat cut option is very nice here. So I think we've talked about how we take less bone, and preserve the blood supply with these types of cuts. We can deal with AVN um, because you can bone graft and you can get support in other areas of the talus. From a second stage post-joint uh, infection, this is a nice option because you've all often taken out a bunch of bone and sometimes you also have to graft. That is also the case with prior Taylor implants. And when we talk about the short neck and the collapsed dome, this is a great implant. Now, what is the data here? And there's really not much of it. There's really not. This is a nice study looking at the influence of, I wouldn't say it's the greatest study, but it's a study. There's not a lot out there. This is the influence of geometry and depth of resection of bone support, best depth of resection on bone support for total ankle replacement. Okay, this is in Foot and Ankle International from 2017. It was a modeling study, right? So they, they made 3D models based on CT data of 116 patients. Okay, they cut the models at various depths and looked at round, versus flat cuts, okay? And you can see that in the, in the photographs that I, uh, that I amended over there, okay? And basically what they found was a flat cut had less bony support versus a round cut, right? And that makes sense. We understand that based on the trabeculae. Um, and it was worse with the tails than it was in the tibia. And the less bone that was resected, the more support we had. Now, I'm not sure exactly what to conclude from this study. It was a modeling study. It was not a clinical study. Um, and the authors on the design team were for a design team with a radius-based cutting implant. Um, but nonetheless, that's the only data available on, flat, on, the, on the flat cut versus a rounded cut. Um, so I would urge you to consider the flat cut. There's a lot of options. That means there's a lot of um, scenarios, clinical scenarios that you're gonna encounter where a flat cut might be advantageous to you. Um, and without any further ado, let's kind of move to cases because I think that's where we're gonna see how the flat cut can be useful in your total ankle practice. All right, so thanks, Dave. So I'm gonna show a few cases and then Dave will show some cases. Um, this is a 36 year old uh, individual with a history of multiple ankle sprains who then goes on to develop significant uh, uh, ankle arthritis and has all this heterotopic bones forming on the uh, distal aspect of the fibula and also actually over to the posterolateral aspect of the 
of the ankle. And so here's one at the age of 36, you know, you get a CT scan. Uh, usually we'll, we'll try to do weight bearing CT scans on most of our total ankles to get a better idea of alignment and also look at the, uh, uh, in cases like this, where, where all the osteophytes are and where, whether I may need to make a secondary incision and in this case, make a lateral incision. But here in a young individual, uh, um, echoing what David said, which is taking less bone, I think um, I, I, I opt more for in my young individuals who have a normal tali where there's not uh, a very uh, shallow dome or a very flat dome that I opt still for doing a chamfer cut. And again, with our instrumentation being very uh, efficient and easy, I find that it's uh, been uh, working really well. Obviously, we had to make a lateral incision here, clean out that lateral uh, um, osteophyte because it was acting as a doorstop for, for correcting the ankle. And actually, the patient had some perineal uh, issues as well that we had to take care of. But Dave, do you still use a chamfer cut? And if so, what are your indications for the chamfer? So I think in patients with virtually normal anatomy, the chamfer cut is my go-to. Yeah. Um, it does in all implant systems, a, the ours resects less bone. Um, right. The chamfer cut resects less bone. Um, and um, unless I'm compelled to use the flat cut, um, I will, you know, go with the chamfer cut. It's, it's, it's an extremely easy technique. Right. Yeah. And I agree with you. That's, that's my go-to as well for, for those kind of scenarios with normal anatomy. And again, for a younger individual who you think will need one, maybe two revisions in their lifetime, the more bone stock I can keep, the better off I am for the next surgeries down the line. So this is a 65-year-old uh, gentleman, uh, unrelenting ankle pain. You can see his plantar flexed a bit and uh, has ankle arthritis from the posterior aspect of the ankle. And here's one that I thought that once we could uh, um, get some correction of the, on the flat foot deformity, that we could actually um, be able to take minimal bone through a flat top. And I know it's not a perfect lateral, so you can't see that uh, laterally, but, but it made sense to me to, just with a flat top to take a lot of, uh, a little bit of bone away on the talus and, and uh, one where I, I opted for it. Um, Dave, any issues in this scenario for doing a flat top? I think that, um, I think you could have gone either way here. I mean, I, I, you know, how old was this individual, do you remember? 65. Yeah, I mean, you could have gone, kind of gone either way. This implant will probably last them their whole life. Um, but the, um, I mean, their tailor anatomy looked pretty reasonable to accommodate either implant. Yeah. Um, and really the other thing is, is I also look at uh, how much motion the patient has beforehand. Um, the, Flat cut is easier to do uh, in patients who are who are fairly tight. That's true. That is true. Um, here's a patient of mine at the age of 17, oh, kind of uh, early in my years of practice, uh, history of an open Hawkins 4. Um, one of my partners who was on call did this, um, and the patient eventually ended up with bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. She had had a number of procedures with me leading up to uh, the ankle replacement. So she gets a star ankle replacement. This is now about 12 years old, this star ankle replacement, and she's having more and more pain. And, uh, and, and you know, when you look at this, Dave, to your point, you can't understand what's going on under that talus because you can't see underneath it. And, um, and you can see there's something in the distal tibia right between the two uh, stems, the two pegs in the tibia. So we get a CT scan and a spec CT, and you can see that there's a little bit of a cyst on the talus, but on the tibial side, there's a large cyst. And on the spec CT, she's lighting up on both sides. <clears throat> and she's gone from against medical advice where she was running four miles every other day to now basically being barely able to walk for her activities of daily living. Um, and, and so that's where she went from with her total ankle when she was first got it, she felt so great. So. Um, this is one that was interesting that, uh, oh, wait, let me stop you for a second. So have you been happy with the spec CT? I've been really happy with it. Like in, like I've, I, I thought that the spec CT was kind of like an applause meter that it was like, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be positive if anything's loose, right? Like it just shows you that something's there like a bone scan, but I've had cases where I said to myself, okay, the talus is loose, but I'm going to be prepared to revise the tibia if I have to. 
But if the spec CT doesn't light up in the tibia, I found that the tibia is well fixed. I was, I've been really surprised and impressed with the, uh, the spec CT. The, yeah. prob the problem is, is that people have a hard time finding a place to get it done. Correct. I think that's been a challenge, but I agree with you. I think it's highly sensitive. And so I still will tug on a, a yeah. component that's not lighting up just for peace of mind. Oh, of course. But I agree with you that um, I don't remember a situation where it didn't light up on a spec CT and I had to still revise it unless I chose to do it otherwise. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, keep going. so this is one that, you know, as David said, you know, you get this pyramidal cut out of the volume of the talus and can be challenging to now do a revision. But again, she's in her mid thirties at this point. And do I want to do something that uh, sets her up, you know, in her lifetime, she's probably going to need one more total ankle, if not two more. So I've got to think about bone stock. And so here's one where I said, you know, let me revise this. And I've done this a number of times now, revise this to a cadence with a flat top tibia, a uh, flat top talus. And so here we're putting the external guide on the left side and the right side. I'm, I'm not uh, paying attention to the pegs and the height of my cut. And instead I'm paying attention to the level of my cut, which is where that horizontal axis is, where the pegs come off of. And I just want to take as minimal bone off the tibia as I can. So I do my tibial resection. I make sure I clear out the back of the tibia. Hey, can um, I interrupt you for a second, Sean? Yeah. So, so a couple of things. So first of all, are you, so I want to point out something just like, I want to see what your thought process is. Do you see on the left x-ray, the AP, do you see how it looks like the guide is curved? Yeah. But it's obviously not. That's like, you know, part of what it sometimes looks like when you use a C-arm. I, I find that particularly frustrating. Is there anything that you found? The only thing that I've found that solves that problem is using a vascular C-arm. The vascular C-arm basically can show you from the tibial tubercle to the foot in one right. cut, um, in one shot. But other than that, you get this like parallax um, effect of the proximal aspect of the guide. And it's really, it's hard to, you know, you're trying to get everything to line up straight and it just sort of throws you off a little bit. Yeah, so I'll always have them scan up on a live view for me up the tibia so that I can watch it the whole way to make sure it's parallel. And I'm not always looking for it to be parallel to the tibial cortex. I'm actually looking for it to be more parallel to the fibula. And then I'll always check one more time at, my, uh, at, the, at the cutting block to make sure I am uh, perpendicular to the long axis. And then the other question I was going to ask is in these situations. So like when I'm revising a implant, I almost always put in medial molar screws. Is that something that you do too? Cause I'm just concerned that like they haven't been walking on it as much. There may be some disuse osteopenia. There may have been some stress shielding medially. I just don't want to break that. I don't think that you're faulted for that at all. I, I, I have partners who do that routinely. I, I'll do it based on each individual patient. So if I feel like there's not a lot of medial mal, or if I'm going to cut into it a little aggressively, then I'll prophylactically put one up at the end of the case. So if I don't put one up in the beginning of the case, and at the end of the case, I feel like I need to, I'll also put it up. I have a very low threshold to do it, but I don't do it routinely. Are you doing it routinely? For revisions. Yeah. Routinely. Yeah. yeah. And like, and that, so for, so, on, so like on this one for the tibial cut, were you, what was your plan? Were you going to graft that cyst? Were you going Correct. to try and like cut above the cyst? Because it probably would be too high of a cut. Yeah, I didn't want to cut above the cyst because it was too high of a cut. My thought was take as little tibia to freshen it up as possible, break into the inferior aspect of the cyst, pack it with autograft, and then um, and, and I use some infuse as well, and then use that and allow it to grow in, um, and then put my tibial tray. So. So, you know, here we are, again, taking as little of the tibia as possible. And then to your point, um, on that left fluoro, I'm really trying to just feather the medial mal. I really don't want to dig into it, again, because I don't want to create a stress riser. And if I do dig into it, like you said, Dave, I'll just go ahead and put a medial mal, prophylactic medial mal screw in. And you can um, really see on that AP how much the keel of the implant goes down into the talus. Behind us, isn't it remarkable? Wow, I know, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, and then um, once I do the tibial cut, we'll go ahead and put the guide on for the flat top talus for the cadence system. 
and I'll make sure on the lateral that I like it. So it's as posterior as I want it to be. It's a little bit deceiving here because you see that angle of black line and you think that that might be the posterior aspect of the tail and it's really not. It actually goes a little bit further back. So um, once we like that, we pin it, we drill our holes. Um, and then once we drill the holes for the, for the tibial pegs, um, we bone grafted the, the cyst, um, got good fixation on the tibial pegs, got great fixation on the tailor side. And then I only had to put a six millimeter poly in on this one, um, which is surprising. I thought I'd have to go to an eight or a 10 before I did this case. And we put a six millimeter poly in and, and she is now about three months out from her surgery and, and uh, still rehabbing, but feeling really good. Anything you would have done differently, Dave? I mean, the only thing I can say is, so wait, did you, what did you do with the keel? Did you graft it? I grafted it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I do. I, you know, you did a TAL. I would have probably done that too. Um, and um, I would have put a screw in the medial mount only because I'm nervous about it. Not because anything went wrong with your case. I'm just always nervous that something's going to happen with it. Yeah. But that's it. And, and the one thing for people, if you haven't used the, uh, the cadence before, if you look at this AP of the x-ray, you'll think that you've uh, actually cut into the fibula, but you haven't. It's because you have an incisura, it's hugging that fibula. And, and just keep that in mind, especially if you have not used the cadence before. Yeah, the implant's wider anteriorly than it is posteriorly. So it looks like it's always in the fibula. Hey, Dave, a question. Um, can you and then I comment on use of flat cut components for all TAR candidates. Seems like there are benefits in the OR, but also seems like not much clinical data pointing in either direction. So I would agree with you. So people have reached out to me on numerous occasions like, hey, is it, this is a pretty easy technique. I like it. It's very straightforward. It's very intuitive. Um, can I just use this for everyone? And I can't say no, but I can't say yes based on any data. Right, I can't say yes, the outcomes are equivalent. And if it's easier for you, go ahead. Um, we're at a phase now in ankle replacement where that conclusion can't be drawn. Um, I think that those of us who do lots of ankle replacements are probably doing a bunch of primary flat cut taluses um, in patients who could go either with a flat cut or with a chamfer cut. Um, and we'll just have to see how the data pans out. Um, and I don't know where, um, you know, Dr. Schoen and Dr. Uh, Saltzman's data on the, you know, the flat cut as opposed to a, a more radius cut in terms of bony stability. I don't know where that's going to suss out um, in terms of failure of the Taylor components because, you know, the, the talus is is essentially the weak link in, in ankle replacement. And I don't think a flat cut, so that, that study suggested that a flat cut on the tibial side would fail also, that it wouldn't be as good as a radius cut. But the flat cut on the tibial side has been satisfactory for over three decades um, on the tibia. So I'm not sure if you can take that data and sort of draw any significant clinical conclusions about how a flat cut talus is gonna perform versus a chamfered cut talus. So I'm, yeah. I'm willing to try it in patients uh, as a primary, and I've been doing so. Yeah, so I, I think that I agree with everything you said. The only thing I would say is if you have a younger patient and you think they need, may need multiple total ankles in their lifetime, then you want to, in my opinion, keep as much bone stock for as long as possible. And that's where I would do a chamfer cut for sure over a flat cut, unless they have one of the conditions we talked about earlier. Correct. Because, so, like, I just they, think that they have more talus to work with in the future. Right. But if they've got a severely post traumatic talus with uh, AVN or something like that, then I have uh, no problem. Exactly. Right? right. Then you just have to use the implant that they can get. Correct. Correct. So, another question in patients with a plantar flex talus pre op, is correcting tailor declination angle prior to bone cuts as critical? when performing a chamfer cut as it is with a flat cut? So tailor declination angle obviously um, is not as much an ankle problem as it is a, um, like a cavus or a flat foot problem, 
right? And the question is, is do they have a symptomatic flat foot or a uh, cavus foot? Um, you know, when I did my training with Roger, Roger was always of the opinion that if someone has an asymptomatic foot and a congruent ankle, as long as the implant is parallel to the ground, it should succeed. So that's kind of the way I proceed. If someone has a symptomatic flat foot and the ankle is incongruent and, and the talus is down, then I'm going to fix the talus. I'm going to correct the hind foot, all that stuff before I do the ankle replacement. But if not, and the talus is down, I will still just cut it flat. Yeah, I agree with that. I, that's how I, I would uh, do. I currently do my total ankles as well. So asymptomatic cavus or, or uh, pes planus, I let the talus, as long as it's congruent, cut it where it is. If it's symptomatic, then I want to make sure that, so first of all, I'll stage it. So that's another question I'd like to ask you your thoughts, but I will stage it. I'll do my ankle replacement first, but when I do it, I'll make sure I take it out of its plantar flexion so that when I do my cuts, I am already planning for where the foot will be after I bring them back for a stage procedure two to four weeks later to do the rest of the flat foot reconstruction or the cavus foot reconstruction. In those so kind let's, of scenarios, let's, let's are you staging the, uh, or doing them all in one shot? So I'm largely staging it, but let me, let me, let me what my, I think my third case is a staged case. I, I can tell you like my thought process behind it. So let me um, send it over to you. All right, perfect. So let's see. Okay, so let's go through a few cases. They're not long, but they are illustrative. Okay, so I'm gonna go through cases that kind of address the issues that we talked about in my talk about when to do a flat cut. So this is a collapsed flat cut, Taylor. So this is a 42 year old. Um, he's 30 years out from a triple um, for a club foot. Okay, now he has tibiotalar arthritis. And as you can see here, he's really got this like flat, and irregular surface to his talus. He's got some hardware in there, which isn't really the issue, um, but he does have some hardware in there. Um, Seelan, does this patient in your, in your mind, does this patient need some advanced imaging before you go ahead with an ankle replacement or not really? You know, I, I, as you know very well, I've become so much more concerned about Taylor blood supply over the last decade than I ever was. So seeing the amount of sclerosis that I see and the irregularity of that joint, in my hands, that's getting an MRI, a CT scan, um, and the MRI would be with contrast. Um, that's, that's how our radiologists would like to best evaluate for AVN. Yeah, so I got both and he did not, they, they said that he didn't have AVN of the talus. Um, but still, there's no room really for a chamfered cut here, I don't think. You know, I think this is a perfect situation in which you're going to open up the anterior aspect of that ankle and you're going to kind of be staring at the neck of the talus, which is going to be confluent with the dome of the talus. So, you know, technically speaking, you're going to have to get almost to that screw, which is, by the way, that's at the navicular cuneiform joint, right? Um, and that's, a, that's pretty far down. Right, and you're going to have to get flat with it. Even doing the flat cut will be a challenge. So, but that is what we did. Um, we got in there. We were able to distract enough to get the the flat cut nicely. And this is him at um, at six months. Um, you know, you're saving grace here, Dave. And, and sorry to, to jump okay. in. But is that he has a robust subtalar fusion that's 30 years old, that is providing a tremendous a tremendous amount of blood flow to that inferior aspect of the talus. Tons so of blood stock, good blood flow, yes. exactly. Right. Yeah. And like, like you could have also argued that um, maybe I should have taken out the hardware prior to doing this. He was totally asymptomatic there. I don't know. I felt that I could avoid the implant with the hardware and I was easily able to do that. Yeah. So that was the case of a collapsed tail. Here's someone with a short tail or neck. Um, as, you, as you look, this is obviously someone with a tibial deformity um, of both the tibia and the fibula. And you can kind of see right here, it's just really small, right? That's a small, that's a short tailor neck. So from my perspective, there's not a lot of real estate 
to be doing a chamfered cut in this patient. And they have an incongruent valgus ankle. Um, but I think that that degree of deformity preoperatively is easily corrected um, during the surgery. Um, I do use, you know, I, there's that outrigger pole on the guide. I yep. use that separately just to make sure that I'm making a um, orthogonal cut to the mechanical axis. Uh -huh. um, you know, obviously not as anatomic axis because it's all kind of shifted off. Um, but this is kind of what we went with. And um, mm -hmm. I was very happy with it. And you could say, hey, that, that talus is a little uh, plantar flexed, taking off more in the back than you are in the front, um, if we're to be critical. Um, but again, I do say to myself, that's a really short tail or neck. And this was a case where I was very happy with going with the, um, with the flat cut. Any, any, any yeah, I agree. Here? I absolutely agree. This is one I would have done a flat top as, as well. Okay. All right. So this is a more complicated case. So this is a patient who is a 56 year old female police officer, 10 years out from a big procedure. Um, and failed conservative management, we did a, uh, a cadence total ankle. Um, and uh, this is what it looked like. She got a, a wound breakdown and an acute infection. Um, I washed it out, six weeks of IV antibiotics, but obviously she got a deep infection and this failed. Um, so, uh, she has a, a, a flap from a prior procedure. Um, basically, I went in, I took out the implant, IND, lift up the flap, a spacer, six weeks antibiotics, really small medial malleolus. Um, and now we're dealing with a talus that's, there's not a lot of talus there, right? She's cavus, midfoot cavus, not a lot of talus left. And not a lot of talus, that, it look, almost looks like that talus is begging for a flat cut. That talus was begging for a flat cut. Here's an example we used at uh, Salto XT revision. Um, this is her, at, I think it's over a year out. She's a police officer. She's back to work. I had to take this video because I just couldn't believe she was walking that well. <laughs> That's awesome. And like, she forgets her appointments. That's how happy she is with this. We have to call her and be like, hey, we need to see you back. <laughs> um, so I was very happy with a flat cut in this scenario. I do use really long medial molecular screws. Yep. The most sets don't have medial molecular screws that are that long. So those are 3.5 millimeter fully threaded screws because they're probably like 100 millimeters long because the foil cannulated screws in most of your ORIF sets only go to like 60. So I always make sure that I have those there. Um, and, you know, I, I thought this was an excellent result. With the yeah, this is a great result. And this is one, again, I agree with you. I, I would have put a medial mouse screws in as well uh, because you've left with, you're just left with a shell of a medial mal. And the last thing you want is a stress riser and to bring her back then to fix uh, a, a fractured medial mal. You just, just take the five minutes it takes to put two screws up and be done. All right. So here's the next case. All right. So this is obviously a patient with with bilateral deformities, right? Severe valgus on the left, some valgus on the right, um, severe teller head uncovering, you know, stage 2B um, on the left. Um, and you can see how there's incongruent arthritis. And the question is like, how do you address this? Um, so my plan was um, at first, whoops, I did, it, I did this stage. Okay, and what I did was a tail navicular and a subtalar fusion with a medialized and calcaneal osteotomy. And I made sure that the ankle could be corrected passively. So if it can't be, I'll do some ligamentous releases. Sometimes I'll put in an antibiotic spacer just to hold it there if that's what I've done, if that's what needed to be done. But my thought with staging is if I have to do subtalar or tail navicular fusions and an ankle replacement, even if you can do them in one sitting, I think you get a stiff ankle replacement because you're holding these people still for eight weeks. So what I do instead is I will do the subtalar fusion, tail and avicular fusion, medializing calcaneal osteotomy. I will then schedule them for an ankle replacement at either six or eight weeks. 
by that time, those wounds have healed. They're all obviously out of the total ankle incision anyway. Then I'll go in and I'll do the ankle replacement. And the, the idea from my perspective is I don't let people walk until two weeks after an ankle replacement. So if you had your, let's just call it a subtalar double arthrodesis, and then it had six, you're six, at six weeks, you have your total ankle. At eight weeks from your arthrodesis, you're two weeks out from your ankle replacement. So from my perspective at that point, you can wait around both. And so here's eight weeks later, total ankle replacement, removal of hardware, just because one of the screws was in the way. And, um, you know, I was really satisfied with this result, as was the patient. Um, you that's could nice. argue, what's that? So that's nice. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't have a set way yet to do, you know, do I do a triple first and then do a total ankle or do my total ankle first or triple? I definitely agree with the concept of stiffening the ankle if you do the ankle first and do a triple later. But sometimes I feel like I want to get to the ankle first get that in place and worry about the, the foot later, um, especially in the flexible ones. So, um, and they kind of change depending on the flavor of the patient. Um, so is this something you, you I guess you always do this, uh, if you're doing a fusion, you'll always do the, the triple first or the double first and then do the, the ankle after? Yes, I don't kind of, I don't hem and haw about like, what's the best strategy for me? I've sort of come up with a strategy that seems to be predictable and works, which is this like six week, two week, yeah. you know, yeah. correction, deformity correction first, then ankle replacement second. Makes sense. What are your thoughts about the, um, the flat cut for primaries? Um, I, I don't have a problem for flat cuts with primaries. Again, unless... Um, I have a younger individual who has good anatomy that doesn't have a flat Taylor dome. Um, then I'd prefer to do the chamber just to keep more bone stock, but otherwise I don't have a, an issue at all doing flat tops. Okay. Um, I guess there's a question, Dave, when do you have patients weight bear after ankle replacement? For me, um, if I'm not doing any fusion work or any osteotomy work, then I will let them start walking at week three in a boot. If I do any osteotomies or any fusions or, or ligament work, then I lock them down in a cast for six weeks before I let them walk on it in a boot. So wait, let me ask you. So when do you take out their stitches? Week three. Okay. So is that when you first see them? No. So I, I actually have a very, um, we, we have an intense wound closure procedure. So on all of my closures, you know, we'll close a capsular layer. Um, so we'll put vein powder in, close the capsular layer, close the tendon sheath. Then I'll actually put down a layer of amniotic tissue to hopefully decrease adhesion formation, close the subcutaneous tissue, and then we zip tie the, the skin. Um, if you've seen those zip ties, which help to take tension off the skin. And then we will put an incisional vac on top of it. Because of that incisional vac, we want to get the, the vac off by the seven day mark. So we will see them um, in the operating room, they get placed in a bulky Jones splint. We will see them back a week later. And most of our total ankles are outpatients. So we see them back a week later, they get the wound vac part taken off. Everything else stays on. Then they get placed in a short leg non-weight brain cast. And they're in that till week three. At week three, all the stitches come out or the zip ties all come off. Interesting. So I do, uh, I do, I put in the vein powder, I call, close the capsular and fascial layer, sub subcutaneous tissue. I, I close the skin with nylons um, with a running vertical mattress suture. It doesn't uh -huh. cross the incision, it just goes underneath it. Um, at one, they, are, they go into a, you know, a bulky splint. At one week, we see them back and we put them in an unaboot, like, which is a compre like a basically compressive unaboot. We see them back at two weeks, take out their stitches and I allow them to walk on it in a boot until the sixth week. They can remove it for range of motion. They can take it off to shower. They can sleep without it. Um, yeah. yeah, that seems to work with me. I mean, I think, you know, Tim, Tim Daniels in Toronto, he has the kind of the nicest system where someone comes into the operating room and puts on this weight bearing brace, oh, yeah, the brace. <laughs> at the time of surgery and they walk this the next day. I just right. don't have access to that. No, we don't either. Yeah. So Dave, before you move on, the question for you is, uh, for this specific case, do you have them strictly non-weight bearing then without 
going through any rehab or range of motion immediately do the ankle uh, replacement and so uh, sorry i'm trying to read okay. this okay so the question is this for this case that you showed do you have them strictly non-weight bearing uh without going through any range of motion or rehab um or after the fusion want, after the fusion correct so after the fusion patients are non-weight bearing for a total of eight weeks and they're not doing any range of motion exercises. Before they can do they as much life. range of motion as they want to after two weeks. After two weeks. So I don't, so patients who have ankle fusions, I cast. But patients who have subtalar or talonavicular fusions, at two weeks, I put them in a boot. And I tell them, you can come out of it and you can not sleep with it. You can do range of motion of your ankle, but I don't have them do exercises. I just tell them, hey, if your ankle moves, it's fine. Okay. Um, and I don't, but I don't do any formal physical therapy or anything like that. Before the total ankle. Because the total ankle is done at a point where the fusion hasn't finished healing. Right. So then when you do this ankle replacement in this patient specifically, how long are they non-weight bearing? Two weeks. Two weeks. That takes, us, on... that takes us to either the eighth or the ninth week after the fusion. Okay, perfect. And, and then, then they're weight, weight, bearing, and they're weight bearing in a boot for a month. Okay. And then in general, for your total ankles, are, do you, are you a believer of PT? I am, and only specifically because it gets people to do stuff, right? People need balance. People need to work on their range of motion. You know, data from our center has shown that really after six months, you will see no improvement in ankle dorsiflexion. And I think that a lot of people who are stiff, who wanna get more dorsiflexion, they'll get it more with therapy than they will without. The joint replacement literature is replete with commentary about how physical therapy is a complete waste of time for knee, for knee and hip replacement. Um, and I would argue that if you had ankle replacements walking, within 12 hours of the, of the surgery, going about their activities of daily living right afterwards, then maybe therapy wouldn't be needed either. But we don't, we don't have that luxury. Right. Yeah, what I agree. I, I'm a big fan of physical therapy. I started at week six and they work on motion, strength, gait training, balance training. Um, but I think that just like you said, it gives them something to do, first of all. Secondly, you have somebody who's in the healthcare field who's monitoring this patient once or twice a week so that if there is an evolving problem with the wound breakdown or wound stuff or whatever it may be, you have somebody who can call you and say, hey, Dr. Parekh, you may want to take a look at this patient before you know, the 12-week the, uh, mark. So, And I have like yeah. a three-page protocol that I send to the physical therapist. Yeah, I do too. Not, not specifically because the, the therapy is so complicated, but because a therapist who sees someone with an ankle replacement who has never seen one is like, I don't even know what to do, right? Yeah. And so I kind of just want to make it simple for them so that yeah. it's a good yeah. experience for both. Mine's the same way, three pages. Um, okay, without getting into too much detail, if during the dissection portion, you're unable to close the retinaculum, what do you do? So um, I've not had that in an ankle replacement, but I've had that in, in other surgery. Um, and basically you can pie crust the, um, the incision. So in other words, you can, make real, you can make relaxing incisions, both medial and lateral to your central incision. Um, that's a plastic surgery technique that is used frequently um, when patients have too much swelling. The only situation, I've never seen that occur, but um, I would urge you to use a tourniquet um, as um, I doubt that that, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think that would be fairly rare. Um, yeah, I haven't seen I would also say either. you should close with the ankle in neutral to slight dorsiflexion because it takes tension off of the tibialis anterior, which allows it to go underneath the rat retinaculum. Yeah, I agree with all that. I, I don't, uh, I have not had that happen either, but I think if it did, um, and if you really couldn't even pie crust, you can use one of these amniotic type of products and it creates a little bit of a layer. And I'm not sure if over time that becomes retinaculum or whatever kind of tissue it may become, but it certainly, I think, will help with the gliding of the tendon and protect the tendon in case that wound breaks down. 